Um, we've been in the book of Nehemiah uh, for several weeks now, and uh, we are at chapter 7. And I don't know how many of you make a habit of maybe going back and checking on what maybe I share on Sundays from the books of the Bible, or in particular the book of Nehemiah. Uh, but if you know anything about the book of Nehemiah, once we get to about this point in the book of Nehemiah, it gets a little hairy because there are lots of names and there are lots of lists. How many of you love lists? Like you make lists, you keep track of lists. Okay, then you should love this part of the book of Nehemiah, okay? You should just love it because it is list after list after list. And it's really easy to think that these lists aren't that significant, but they are. They truly, truly are. Here's, here's the deal. Um, there was a stark reminder uh, that hit me um, as I got uh, a bit older, but it was probably really late elementary school, so I wasn't that old. That's when I noticed that my family was a little bit different uh, from the other kids' families. I noticed that tons of kids had a mom, and a lot of them also had fathers. But I didn't have a dad. There's one time that stands out in particular in the most painful way of my young elementary age school life. It was an incident that took place when I was actually in upper elementary. My school was Mohawk Elementary School. We were the Mohawk Mohawks. <laughs> But they were planning an outing for kids and their families. It was simply a matter of signing up and letting the school know that you wanted to go. However, right before the event was to happen, I discovered or I was told that the outing was specifically designed for boys and their dads. I'm not sure how I missed that part of the announcement, but I did. And I was devastated because, like I said, I, I didn't have a dad in my home. It meant that I didn't fit, that there was no place for me to be part of that event. And I remember it as a very unique pain of my childhood, the realization that there was no place for, for me. In the book of Nehemiah, place and belonging are as central to the story as has been the work of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. However, that aspect of this work doesn't really reveal its importance until we get to this point in the book of Nehemiah, this point, this place in the journey through the rebuilding work on those walls of Jerusalem. Here's what I want you to hear loud and clear today. When we're eager, or when we are engaged in the work that God calls us to, we will discover that he has a place that is specifically and uniquely designed for each of us to fit into in order that we might make a truly unique impact. Would you pray with me? God, open our hearts and minds this morning. Lord, as we think about Nehemiah, the work that he has done has called the people to. But God, even beyond that, as he begins to get specific about the place that each of the people who have come to be part of this work are called to step into, are called to be, uh, to be unleashing their gifts in. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. You know, Nehemiah, Nehemiah being the gifted leader that he has demonstrated himself to be, he makes a very subtle but definite shift as it relates to kind of the next steps and the work that's talked about here in the book of Nehemiah. He makes space in all of his building for what I think is a strategic place in 
God's plan. Reading it from verses 4 and 5 in Nehemiah chapter 7, and we read these words. Now the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. So my God, Nehemiah is talking here, so it's my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. Now, Nehemiah is beginning to make it clear that strategically speaking, that now that the safe, large, rebuilt, and walled city is rebuilt, that's not enough. He begins to say that's quite not enough. In order for the city to thrive and, and to become everything that it could be, it needed to be populated. It needed people. It needed to be alive with the noises, the sound, the good, and the bad of people. And in verse 5, Nehemiah says, I found the geological record of those who had been the first to return. Now, folks, these are the people who had actually come back about 80 years earlier, we learn, and under the leadership of a man named Zerubbabel. Everybody say Zerubbabel. That's good. Say it again. Zerubbabel. Right. Zerubbabel is the leader that 80 years ago brought a bunch of people back. And actually, Nehemiah is now using these records. He's using the records of who came back. It's kind of a template to plan uh, not just for the rebuilding of the city, but also the repopulation of the city. Now, I'm not exactly sure why, but I have always carried a deep love for the city. I was born in New York City. Actually, I was just talking to somebody about this the other day. I was born in Manhattan, raised in Queens. I lost my New York accent very quickly. People in the South and here in the Midwest aren't real hip when someone talks like a New Yorker. Because if you talk like that too much, people will let you know something's wrong with the way you talk. So I've always loved the city. Um, I grew up there, but then for a few years lived in North Carolina, moved to Chicago, lived in the city, Chicago, then in the suburbs. Then we lived in the Indianapolis area. And just about five to ten minutes south, something like that, of the city of Seattle, now close to the city of Detroit. I believe cities are a critical part of God's plan for humanity. I believe that God loves the city. These are strategic places that the plan of God can actually be in, enacted in order to reach the world with the good news of Jesus. Did you guys know that in the 1950s, only about 750 million people lived around the world in cities? Currently, living in cities around the world, there are 4.5 billion people. 4.5 billion people. The experts say that by the year 2056, 2050, or 2050, by the year 2050, that number will double. So there will be almost 10 billion people living in cities around the world. 26 years from now. That's what they're predicting. And as we look at Nehemiah's response to what needs to happen behind these rebuilt walls of the city of Jerusalem, I find myself being curious. What's our response to the city that God's maybe placed us in? What's, what's, what's your plan for the people in your own neighborhood? Like Nehemiah, do, do we notice do we notice people in our neighborhoods? Maybe people who um, we would say are, have various difficulties that they're working through in life. Maybe there's insecurities that we know other people are having, like food insecurity, or maybe there's financial insecurity. Are we paying attention to the various negative, maybe environmental impacts that people are having to, to deal with? Do we see people's physical needs as well as maintaining really a sensitivity to the spiritual shortcomings of wherever we live. Nehemiah 
in the coming chapters we discover, he's going to be asking people to purposely return and repopulate the city of Jerusalem. They will do it because that city was considered to be the center of life with God. It's their way of contributing to the overall health, the well-being, the future, actually, of the nation of Israel. It's a strategic place in God's plan. Nehemiah calls for the people to think strategically about place, relocating to the city of Jerusalem. But there's something else we see in this same chapter of Nehemiah. We see the recognition, uh, he, he makes a call for the recognition and the practice of specific gifts for God's plan. In verses uh, 66, 6 through 60 of chapter 7, he lays out this really long list. Remember I talked, I asked you about lists. He lays out this really long list of various gifts and forms of service that over the last number of years, they've been performed by people who are returning to the region around Jerusalem. This list includes people who are gifted their priests, their, their Levites, their singers, gatekeepers, temple servants, who had been originally assigned responsibilities going back to King David. There were descendants of Solomon, King David's son. He was able to find descendants of uh, Solomon's servants, and they were appointed uh, to assist in various tasks that needed to be done in and around the temple that was built by Solomon. All these different gifts, all these different abilities, these assignments, he's now calling them out in order to further fulfill God's plan for the nation of Israel behind these rebuilt walls of the city of Jerusalem. There's work to be done, specifically by gifted people. In this book of Nehemiah, the Apostle Paul echoes this thought of the importance of doing what you're called to do. He writes this in Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. Paul says, Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you've received in the Lord. Do what you're supposed to do. That's what Nehemiah is now calling and beckoning for people to do. Nehemiah is pointing to, he's calling forth specific abilities and gifts in order that the work and flourishes, not just gets finished, but there's a flourishing. These gifts have to emerge for the city of Jerusalem to become what God intends for it to become. Nehemiah is calling for an all-out team effort. Now, long before the legend, how many of you have ever heard of the Iditarod race? You've heard of that? The Iditarod dog race? It was first run officially in 1973. But a more important race took place in Alaska on January 21st, 1925. The lives of countless children in Nome were at stake. There was an epidemic of diphtheria that broke out, and the gold rush city of Nome did not have a sufficient amount of antitoxin. I think there's a movie called Baldo about this, right? Well, Dr. Curtis Welch, he telegraphed Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, he, Fairbank, he, he telegraphed Anchorage, Alaska, and Seward, Alaska. And Juneau, he's contacting all of these cities by telegraph asking for help. Now, what happened was they were able to collect 300,000 units of this serum at the hospital in Anchorage. It was the only serum in the entire state. And if you know anything about Alaska, Alaska is almost as big as the continental United States. The problem was to get it to Nome in the shortest amount of time. And with the Bering Sea being frozen, anybody ever watch Deadliest Catch? On TV, Deadliest Catch, the fishermen on, yeah, they operate in the Bering Sea. But it, when it ices up, it becomes a problem. And with the Bering Sea frozen, no railroads or roads extending to Nome's remote location, dog teams are called in 
as the only solution. So the hospital packed the 300,000 units in an insulated container. They transported them to Niana on an overnight train. And once the serum arrived, there was a 674 mile. 674 miles is the mile you would go from here to Kansas City. So 674 miles this medicine had to be transported. They got the medicine to a bunch of dogs on relay teams. Mushers who delivered the mail normally, they would cover that distance. It took them a month to cover that 674 miles. The first musher took the insulated cylinder of serum, 52 miles, where they passed along the baton to the second musher, who traveled 31 miles. From musher to musher, the relay continued until a total of 20 dog sled drivers had cooperated to get the needed medicine to Nome by February 2nd. Folks, they transported that medicine in 127 and a half hours due to kind of this cooperative team effort of individuals willing to brave the Alaska wilderness, the sub-zero temperatures, blending uh, uh, their talents together. A team effort, the best skills to accomplish that task. That's what Nehemiah is now calling for. He's telling people who are now back inside of this, this city to become interdependent on one another, an interdependent force for good for the nation, for the continued rebuilding of Jerusalem. Nehemiah recognizes the importance of Jerusalem and everybody having a strategic place in God's plan. Additionally, Nehemiah says there are specific gifts that everyone has that need to come into play. Here's the third thing that Nehemiah does. He asks for a spiritual commitment to God's plan. Nehemiah chapter 7 still. We're going to look at verse 64. Nehemiah says, or we read here, that these, meaning the people who are now uh, back in the area, these search for their family records, but they could not find them. And so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor meaning himself, therefore ordered them not to eat any of the most sacred food until there could be a priest ministering with the Urim and the Thummim. Now, you read this passage of the story, and it becomes quite easy to be confused by, by what we're reading here. Lost or misplaced family records, language, about being considered unclean, talk of sacred food, serving the priests who's using the Urim and the Thummim. What in the world is all that? What's going on with Nehemiah at this point? As he's calling the people, Nehemiah is calling the people to do whatever must be done to ensure that they are no longer compromised by the pagan religions that surround them. See, that's what got Israel in trouble in the first place. Their worship of other gods is what caused them to be taken away into Babylonian captivity generations before. And now Nehemiah is calling for renewed spiritual commitment. You know, I think what's really interesting when we get to this point in the book of Nehemiah is where Nehemiah starts with this call, where he initiates this call to spiritual renewal. Another word we would use is revival. Nehemiah looks within. He begins with us. Look back a little bit earlier in this same chapter with me. He says, these are the people. He's just talking about the same group of people that are checking their records and, you know, trying to find out where their family uh, has come from. And he says, these are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles, from Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who had taken captive. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. So Nehemiah is saying, 
spiritually, we need to start here. He's not calling for the other nations that surround Jerusalem, the pagans, the people who don't know Yahweh. He's not calling them to obey and to commit to God. No. Nehemiah is telling God's people, the children of the nation of Israel, to disavow religious practices that center anyone other than the God of Israel. This, he says, has to be done so that the nation of Israel might truly become the people who will eventually introduce the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus, to the entire world. I mention that because I wonder sometimes if we have expectations of people who don't know God, who don't know Jesus, that somehow they're supposed to come become spiritual, that they're supposed to somehow be revived. I think the revival needs to start inside the house of God first. Nehemiah knew that if there were families or there were marriages, wherein one person believed this and the other person believed that, or they had certain spiritual practices or standards that did not align with Israel's law and what it called for. It would only be a matter of time before what is called, I think in the business world, mission creep. We could call it God creep takes place, whereas God is slowly pushed out of the picture because of small but continual compromise. The problem Nehemiah is pointing out with this directive, he says, the problem's not going to come from outside the nation of Israel. Folks, this starts with us from the inside, from within. I wonder just how true in Nehemiah's 5th century day. This is true for us in the 21st century. The greatest challenges to our faith coming from within. Our commitment to God. In the 21st century. I wonder if it's most often thwarted by a refusal to be what God is calling us to be from the inside out. Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a strategic place. There's a call for deploying these gifts. What you're good at, we need it to be put into practice here in the city of Jerusalem. There is this expectation for spiritual commitment. And here's the last thing that Nehemiah calls for. He calls for a sacrificial stewardship and alignment to God's plan. This is what we read beginning in verse 70. A sum of the heads of the families contributed to the work. The governor, meaning himself, gave to the treasury 1,000 derricks of gold, 50 bowls, and 530 garments for priests, some of the heads of the families gave to the treasury for the work 20,000 derricks of gold and 2,200 minas of silver. The total given by the rest of the people was 20,000 derricks of gold, 2,000 minas of silver, and 67 garments for the priest. The priest, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the temple servants along with certain of the people and the rest of the Israelites settled in their own towns. And when the seven month came and the Israelites had settled into their own towns, there's more to the story, but we'll get to that later. It's clear it's clear as we conclude this chapter, this portion of the story of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, there's a call to give to God. But it's not just, just give. It's actually give generously. And even as I share this, it's key to note that this giving here, it's a sacrificial giving of the people who've returned to this region 
And yet, there are people who are giving like this. Their businesses may not have even been established. Maybe their homes haven't truly been completely built. And yet, they still give sacrificially. I wonder, I wonder if the newly established residents believed what Ben Patterson shared. He says, whatever we have, we have because God in his grace and generosity, he's given it to us. When we realize this, there comes into our lives a joyful gratitude for what we do have. And we are freed from resentment and anxiety over what we do not have. But even still, it wasn't enough just for Nehemiah to call for the people to give. Once again, we see Nehemiah setting a leadership example, the proper example, in verse 70, when we say, when we read that the governor gave to the treasury 1,000 derricks of gold, 50 bowls, 530 garments for priests. Nehemiah knew that his example of being generous would be an encouragement to all the other people to do the same. Trusting obedience in God. Confirming our trust that we believe God's going to meet our every need. I don't want you to miss out as we continue through this story of the rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah knew a couple of things. He knew there needed to be physical safety. He knew that there needed to be a social awareness, that there needed to be a stable economy, that this rebuilt city needed to be a place where everyone, everyone had a seat at God's table. He also knew that none of that would matter if the people ultimately did not or refused to trust in and worship God. And it needed to be God and God alone. There's a book by a guy named Atul Gawan. I love that name, Atul Gawan. The book's called Being Mortal. And it tells a story of Bill Thomas. Bill Thomas was a man in the 1990s who started working as the medical director of Chase Memorial Nursing Home in the town of New Berlin, New York. He was only 31, and he had little or no experience in healthcare. He didn't know anything about elder care. But with his newcomer eyes, Bill was shocked by the three plagues. There's a three plagues that are associated with nursing home existence. Boredom, loneliness, and helplessness. And he had a very simple plan. Start bringing gardens, children, and pets into the nursing home. Lots of pets. Now, a lot of you know that this is something that's commonly done right now. Pets always. But did you once upon a time, that was like, no, we don't do that. We don't do that. But I want to read you a short snippet of a conversation that Bill had with a nursing home director to have him bring plants into the home. I want something like this. How about a dog? Thomas asked. Well, but there are safety code issues. But maybe so, maybe so, the director said. Let's try two dogs, Thomas said. It's against code, they said. Well, let's, let's just put it down on paper. Let's just put it down on paper. Yeah, no commitments, put it down on paper. Okay. But Dr. Bill really wasn't seeing a lot of enthusiasm as he was explaining this. So, he thought he'd just push a little bit more. He said, how about cats? How about we bring some cats? You want dogs and cats? They asked. But then they agreed. Perfect, Bill said. And we, you know, we need more sound of life around this place. You know what would be best? The sound of birds singing. Let's put down 100. 100 birds in, in, in this place? You must be out of your mind. Have you ever lived in a house that has two dogs 
Four cats and a hundred birds? No, Bill said as he was smiling. But wouldn't it be worth trying? Eventually, Dr. Bill wore them down and they ordered the birds. The 100 parakeets all arrived on the same day. But the uh, bird cages hadn't come in yet. So the delivery man released the birds into the nursing home's beauty salon. The results were extraordinary. The number of prescriptions halved with a particular reduction in the use of psychotropic drugs. And the mortality rate fell about 15%. This was a starting point for a larger program named, biblically appropriate, Eden Alternative. Why was Eden Alternative so successful? The writer of the book concludes that we, we need loyalty or, or dedication to a cause beyond ourselves. It doesn't matter if the cause is small, as small as caring for a pet, or large. What matters is that such a cause provide meaning to one's life. We all need loyalty, and elderly people need it even more. People also need a sense of belonging. We have an innate desire to be a part of something larger than ourselves. And when we are connected to life and to each other, we thrive. When we are disconnected, we die. Everyone has a place at God's table. Everyone needs a sense of belonging. This is what Nehemiah teaches us in Nehemiah 7, chapters 4, verses 4 through 73. This is what it means to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, the place of God's people. Pray with me. So God, we acknowledge, Lord, that it is not simply just enough to have a place. Lord, we need to include, make space, deploy gifts. Lord, perhaps even, Lord, there is something in us that needs to be completely surrendered to you that we haven't to this point, so that, God, you might be glorified. God, we recognize that this rebuilding work, Lord, it requires much. But God, you have a place for each of us to fill, unique place, so that we might ultimately make you well-known to others who do not know who you are. God, we thank you for the story that comes to us from this book of Nehemiah, the work of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. May we be rebuilders too. We love you. We thank you. We pray this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. 